All right, so, so Vendy's explanation was really good. Um, I, will, I will explain a little bit uh, for the English, for those that, that don't know Tongan yet, but we are going through the series of Acts. So we're on Acts chapter 18 now, uh, verses 1 to 23. I've got some maps there. Again, I like maps. Maps is there. So that's so you can see what is happening in this story. Okay, so where Athens is, the very beginning of the chapter, that is the pink, all right? And that's where Paul starts. Now, he goes to Corinth there in the green, and this is where he meets Priscilla and Aquila, and, and then he explained already who, the, who they are, all right? They were Jews. They were kicked out from Rome, and they came there, and he met with them. They worked together. They worked. And then, um, and Paul was continuing preaching at Corinth, right? Right, right where he's at Corinth there today. Now, the main part of this chapter in just the beginning, of verses 123, it's kind of focused around Corinth. Um, but there is some other parts. Now, when you see when the brothers came from Macedonia there that's in the yellow, that was, Paul, that was Silas and Timothy. Right? They came and Paul was able then to go and focus, devoted purely on preaching and teaching the word of God. Uh, he leaves there and he's leaving with um, Priscilla and Aquila, or Aquila and, and uh, Priscilla, and he gets to Centraea, in the light blue, that's where he shaves his head for a vow. He makes a vow. I'm not, it doesn't tell us what vow he makes, but he does make a vow. Goes to Ephesus there in the orange. All right? And he leaves Aquila and Priscilla. They part ways there. And he goes, teaches the word of God. And then from then on, he continues to talk about the word of God. Now, in um, Ephesus, they want him to stay, but he says, no, if I will be back if God wills it. And he leaves from there, lands at the dark blue area there, the Caesarea, goes to Jerusalem there in the green, greets the church, and then heads up to Antioch. That's his destination. That's where he wanted to be. All right? And he stays there for a while. And then at the end, in verse 23, that's where his third journey starts. And there's a separate map for that one will be towards the end where you can see. In verse 23, he goes around there in the gray area, which is Galatia and Phrygia, and this is strengthening the disciples. All right, so point one is from verses 1 to 11, and that is the church should not be lazy and work together to speak the word of God as servants of Jesus, the Messiah. So if you can see that, um, we can read together. If, it, if it's too far or too small, uh, pull out your Bibles and we'll read it together. Um, let's read. After this, he left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife. Because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome, Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes and told them, Your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to the house. So he left there, went to the house of a man named Tidius Justice, a worshipper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, along with his whole household, Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed, and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking, and don't be silent. For I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and a half, teaching the word of God among them. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So you guys pretty much understand uh, uh, what's happening there. All right, so he goes, he's at Corinth. And he works as a tent maker there with Aquila and Priscilla, who he meets there. Now, it's not until his brothers again come, which is uh, Timothy and uh, Silas, and he's able to devote now to preaching. So they're helping each other, like Benny was explaining. And he's preaching and teaching those in the synagogue, this is the church, teaching them that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, again, we know through all of Acts, there's always resistance. There's always somebody or, or something that's resisting um, the gospel. And a lot of it is always from inside the church. Right? 
The Lord strengthens him, visits him in a dream, and said, don't be afraid, keep preaching. He is with him, and he has many people in the city. So Paul stays there for 18 months, which is about a year and a half, and continues to preach. All right, look, there are a few things here we can see that Paul does. Again, once Paul isn't lazy. He isn't lazy. He works with Aquila and Priscilla while he stays with them and still preaches and reasons every Sabbath with the Jews and the Greeks in the synagogue. In the synagogue. Right, he isn't a burden to them. He doesn't sleep all day like some of us. Right? He's productive where he, where he is staying. Are we productive at home? When we're at home, or are we people that will only do something if it will benefit us? Is that, is that who we are? We'll only lift up a finger when we're going to get a reward or something? See, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, In fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. For we hear there are some among you who are idle. They are not busy. Be busy bodies. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there's always working. There's, it's not working for salvation because you cannot earn that. If, if you're thinking that I'm talking about working for salvation, no. I'm talking about those that respond to Christ as Christians. We're not lazy. We're not just at home. Right? Paul doesn't use the excuses like we use today. How tired are we when we come home from work? Is it that much of a burden? Like Venny was mentioning, to get the Bible and gather your family together and read to them the word? Is it that much? Is that, is that hard to pray with them? Are we that drained? We spend so much energy at work because we're getting paid. That when we come home, we don't want to thank God. We're too tired. We want to rest again for the next day. And it's a cycle all over, all over again. Luke chapter 19, verse 17, that's there. If we can read it together. Well done, good servant, he told him. Because you have been faithful in a very small matter, have authority over ten towns. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, this is a story where uh, the king gave bags of money or to three people and told them to do something with it. One of them went and buried it and didn't do nothing. The other two, uh, they got something back. One doubled it. Um, and the other one got a, got a bit more extra. Now, can Jesus say that to us, that we've been good and faithful servants? Are we good and faithful servants to Christ? If we've been unfaithful to Jesus with the little family that he's given us, with the family, how much more unfaithful would we be when we're together as a big church, when he gives us the family of Christ? If we can't do the small things, the things that matter the most at home with our families, how much worse would we be when we gather together like this? See, there's two types of servants at home. There's one that will tell you what to do, the one that wants to be the commander, always telling you, you should do this, you should do this, you should do that. Maybe that's how they see they're helping you, by telling you things to do. There's another one that actually helps. Not just talk, does the actions. Matching their words. Like the brothers that came from Macedonia, they helped Paul. Paul was able to go and preach. They're still working together. Where are we on this scale with the one and twos? Most of us, we're probably number one. We like to tell people what to do and just relax. But that's not who we should be. We should work together to glorify Christ. Right? See, in a way, if we don't continue to teach our families and proclaim the word at home, it's almost like we're rejecting it. We already dusted the dust of this. Jesus already come and said, blood's on your own heads. The guilt is on your own heads. What are we afraid of? What are we afraid of proclaiming the word? Are we afraid of rejection? Paul, we've seen it through Acts. Paul's been rejected everywhere he goes. But not always. He's got God. We serve a powerful Lord. That's Jesus. We shouldn't be afraid. Being a Christian, right? So we've got to live and reflect. We're not afraid, like Benny said in verse 9 and 10. We're not afraid because Christ is with us. So we don't blame him. We don't look to blame anyone else. If we reject the gospel, it's on our own heads. We're innocent. Gospel's all innocent. 
we're the ones in the wrong, and that's how we should see it. We are always sinners. Point two is from verses 12 to 18. Now, that's the church's response to persecution and attacks. The church's response to persecution and attacks should be prayer through Christ. Can we read together? While well, Galileo was pro council of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the tribunal. This man, they said, is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. As Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or of serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if there are questions about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But none of these things mattered to Galileo. After staying for some time, Paul said farewell to the brothers and sisters and sailed away to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. He shaved his head at Centrea because of a vow he had taken. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there's another map there that's, that will show that's where we are in the story right now. That's the chapter, all right? There's Corinth and Centrea, and he's heading to Syria there. That's the Antioch, the one that I was telling you about a while ago. It's near the sea. Now, again, we can see the united attack. All right? It's always united. They are united against Paul, bringing him to the tribunal. Now, the proconsul is the judge in this area. Right? He's like the prime minister, he's the governor. He's the one that decides um, who gets punished and not according to the Roman uh, law. Now, <coughs> he couldn't care less about the Jewish law. If it's got nothing to do with the Roman law or for him, wherever he's, uh, he's the proconsul of, he doesn't want to hear it. It's got nothing to do with him. So what, what was the response there? These are people from the church, from inside the church. They didn't attack Paul. They ended up getting the leader, and they beat him up. That was their response. And then Paul, again, he was, after, after that attack, they stayed, they left to Centrea, and they're heading off to Syria. Now we see, again, united attack against the gospel and the Lord's servants from the people inside the church. Yes, we understand. We understand that there will always be attacks from our side. But let's go deeper to the houses, our house churches. There was no buildings back then. It was all in the house. Let's go closer to home. Now, are we the attackers in our homes? Do we use the Bible to attack our families? When things don't go away, we start attacking family. And we use the Bible a lot. You know, you hear, you hear, why do you go to church? You shouldn't go to church. You're so angry. Why are you angry? If that's what church is like, don't go there. This is what you hear. You hear a lot, and these, you end up accusing people of things, of their wrongs. But you can't see our own wrongs, right? It's very hard to see it. We end up being the accuser and we say things like those things that I mentioned earlier. Sometimes it's good to stop and think. Pray before lashing out. But then again, if you don't do that, it can be hard because you never see yourself as wrong. There's no wrong in being an accuser. But what if we are the ones being attacked, like Sosthenes? Expect it, even from family. Expect it. If someone was to say, come to Christ because everything will be perfect in this world, they're a liar. We already know the struggles you'll go through for taking up your cross. But the reward far outweighs the cons that you go through. But what can we do as believers in Christ? What can we do? Isaiah 53 uh, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7. Let me read this to you. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before his shearers. He did not open his mouth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is Jesus. This, this is the prophecy about Jesus going to the cross. He didn't open his mouth. He went. Like a lamb that's getting ready to be slaughtered. He went. He remained quiet. 
How are we supposed to respond? Well, look, Luke 23, verse 34. It's there. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. It is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we pray. That's what Christ did. He prayed. He prayed for them to be forgiven. They don't know what they're doing. We didn't know what we were doing before we found Christ. Those that are in Christ, you have way more help than those outside. You have a powerful Lord who owns everything, who's resurrected, alive now. He's given us the spirit. We have a lot of help today. Sometimes it's good to stop and think before you lash out and start being an accuser. But if you're being attacked, take courage, be encouraged that we serve a powerful Lord. If home, if you're always at home and it's always a battleground, come to church. Don't stay home. Mingle with God's people. This is the difference. The ones outside the church, they will just do things that they want. Things that they hear, things that they feel. The ones in the church will always be a servant to others. Will pray for you. They will help you and encourage you through the word of God. That's the biggest difference. Outside will tell you you should do this and if it doesn't work, tough luck. Christ is assured. It's a guarantee. The last point is from verse 19 to 23. And that is the church must strengthen each other through God's word. Can we read it together? When they reached Ephesus, he left them there, but himself entered the synagogue and debated with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he declined. But he said farewell and added, I'll come back to you again if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus. On landing at Syria, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church, then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he set out traveling through one place after another in the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so there's that map there. This is what's happening right now. He's at Ephesus. He's going to leave there. They ask him to stay. He says, no, I'll come back if it's God's will. He goes to Jerusalem. He goes and says hello to the church, greets the church there, then goes up to Antioch. From Antioch there, in the very last verse in 23 of today, he starts to go into those areas. Now, the next map will show you that's the third journey now. From verse 23 onwards, that is what we'll be seeing. Now, we see the pattern here of Paul traveling from place to place. He greeting the churches, he correcting people in scriptures when he goes to the synagogues, and he's strengthening the disciples. See, even when asked to stay in Ephesus, he leaves. He leaves it to God's will to lead him, to lead his path. Now, this is one part of the ministry that I, uh, that I myself I find very weak. I'm very weak at visitation. I've got a, I always, I thank God so much for Veni, Setuatalahi, and Mafu. They visit people on a weekly basis. Unless they're sick, of course, but weekly basis, week in, week out, even members outside the church. And they go and see how they're doing. Preach there and teach the word of God there so they can hear it. Is this just a thing for the church leaders? Is it that we just let the leaders go and, and, and do visitations? We don't do the work. How about we go and visit sometimes our Kalashi Aho, maybe? We don't always have to visit, but we can call. We can call, see how they're doing. We can check up on each other. The youth leaders can do the same. They can check up on who hasn't been at church for a while and ask how they're doing. If they don't know, if they're not here, go and see their parents and their siblings. Go and check on them. See how they are. That's what Paul was doing, strengthening his disciples. Or Jesus' disciples. In Acts 16, verse 31, it says there, He escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved, you and your household. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When you go and do visitations, you go and just see, ask them, are they assured? 
If they die today, if they pass away today, are they sort of gone to heaven? If they don't know it, you should know it by now already. You should already know where our assurance comes from. It's in the blood of the Lamb. It's in Christ. That's what you do when you go and do visitations. And, and these are the things that we learn as a church. Right? We learn from our leaders. But we don't just leave it all to the leaders and expect them to do it all the time. We should be doing as well. We should be checking up on each other. Those that's close in our circle. See how they are. For me, that's how I came to Christ. Visitation. I was, my family, me and my family were on our way to hell. We didn't know who Jesus was. Two servants of Christ came over praying. Well, they didn't ask me to come and join the church. They didn't ask for money. They didn't ask for anything. All they wanted to do is come over and pray and tell me about the word of God. I am so grateful to, to God for his mercy because he brought his two servants. I was able to see who Christ is because of that visitation. And there wasn't just a change on the first week. We're talking months here. Before my heart changed, before God opened my heart, and I thank him. Those two servants were my Afu and Fisilose. And I wasn't even going to church at that time. So, we shouldn't be a burden to anyone. We are not lazy people. We work together, help each other to glorify Christ. We may not all be preachers, but there is something that you can do to help the church. If we are attacked, we pray for them. Ask God to forgive them. Ask God to change their hearts that they find the forgiveness in Christ. And repent. We should always... Strengthen each other in God's word. Always. Know your word. How can you strengthen someone if you don't even know your word? It's good to read your Bible. Don't see it as a burden. See it as a joy. 